I was born in Nebraska, and in the formative early years of my life, I was very much influenced by the culture of Nebraska and Western Kansas. My mother and her family were from Western Kansas, and my family was mostly from Central and Western Nebraska. Um, I think that those years were very, very important. Uh, the environment that we lived in was one that I think I regard as very pure and very down to earth and very simple. And I think a lot of the values that uh, I was taught and imbibed there were beneficial to me for the rest of my life. Mm. Uh, and, and so, uh, were you were you sort of uh, raised in kind of an urban setting, rural? Uh, we were country people, mm. and we were all either farmers or veterinarians. And my father and my grandfather were veterinarians. Oh, and I was supposed to be one, but it didn't work out that way. <laughs> More the better for us. Um, so um, and now, in terms of uh, attending school and, 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 and sort of university, did you stay in Nebraska? Um, my father began to develop health problems uh, working in the barns, right. and he had very severe allergies. And it was recommended that he leave the practice because uh, his health would be affected by it. My grandfather, who had helped to establish the vet school at the University of Missouri, was invited to the University of Georgia to help establish their vet school. And he said that there was no need to do that, you know, that his son could stand in for him. So the University of Georgia contacted my father, and given his health situation, he decided to go to Athens, Georgia, to the University of Georgia, and to teach veterinary medicine. So that was an absolutely major shift in our lives. We left the Middle West, and we, live, we left a culture in which for better or for worse, all, all people were white. Right. Huh. Uh, there were a few First Nations, but they were very few. And I remember going to California. Uh, in Nebraska, the great vacation was to go to Colorado. Mm -hmm. And if you were really lucky, you crossed the Rockies and went all the way to Colorado, I mean, to California. Mm. And I remember coming to San Francisco probably in something like 1955 and seeing a black man sitting on a dock and I had to walk out to look at him but I didn't want to be impolite because I knew you're not supposed to stare at people but I had never seen a black man in my life <laughs> and so we left Nebraska and we went to the South, and the South was a whole different world. It was, of course, the segregated South. And the South wouldn't begin to be desegregated until I left it, which was when I was in 10th grade. So I went there in 4th grade and stayed there till 10th grade. And uh, the South very much uh, lived in the... Uh, memory of the Civil War, which they called the War Between the States. In fact, the first day I went to school in Athens, Georgia, my wonderful mother, she told me that when you go to school, the boys are going to come up to you and ask you where you came from. Huh. And they're going to want to know if your state was a Yankee state or a Confederate state. So she says, you tell them that Nebraska was a territory. And you'll have lots of friends. And that's exactly what happened. I went to school, and the white boys got around me, and they asked me where I came from, and I said, Nebraska. And they said, was that a Yankee state? And I said, no, it was a territory. And so then I was allowed to go out and play baseball, and <laughs> it was fun. Right. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's <clears throat> in, in, in being from the South, I, I can certainly attest to uh, like you said, the living in the memory of 
the uh, the great war between the states. And in um, fact, uh, in Athens, Georgia, uh, there were still ruins of the right. old uh, mansions that had been burned down uh, by Sherman. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the war was still there. And the South was very different in those days. It, it wasn't the new South that would begin to develop economically um, in, in later decades. It was a very different part of the world. I think also in my own psychological and spiritual development, spiritual development, that that was something very important because I was dislodged from one world and put into another mm -hmm. and uh, had to shift a lot of gears. Yeah. And uh, I think that that was all part of a broadening experience, which ultimately made me uh, sympathetic with a lot of things that uh, were not in my past. Right. Had you not been exposed to those things. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then again, you know, being from the South, you know, uh, more often than not, the second or third question is what church, you know, which church do you go to? So, so tell yeah. us a little bit perhaps about so, the religious uh, background. My family was a Christian family mm -hmm. and um, Protestant. it was, we had Catholics in our family on my mother's father's side, but they kept that really quiet. And because uh, Catholicism in those days was very unpopular among Protestants. And most Americans, most white Americans in those days were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Um, that was a country in which you had white, black, a few Native Americans, and a few Mexicans that you would meet out in the West and the Southwest. But... Um, our family was a Calvinist family and a Lutheran family. My father's father's family were Lutheran. They were Swiss Lutherans. Um, my mother's maternal family was a very uh, Calvinist family. So we would go between Calvinist churches and between uh, the Lutheran church. However, as I approached maturity, we became very attached to the Lutheran church because there in Athens, Georgia, the pastor of that church was a very affable person, a very good speaker, very dynamic. And so we attached to him. And then as I um, approached my 12th birthday, I took the catechism from him. And I memorized Luther's shorter catechism, word by word, and I understood what it meant. He taught me weekly, uh, along with other children. And you know, then I was confirmed in the Lutheran Church when I was about 12 years old. Mm. Uh, I mean, maybe for the sake of the, the listening audience, um, could you tell us maybe a little bit about the sort of the different ethos between the sort of Calvinist tradition and the Lutheran tradition in, 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 in Protestant Christianity? Um, well, um, that's a long discussion. I think in those, <laughs> uh, in those days, I mean, uh, the Calvinists have a different effect on history. Hmm. It's very, very important. Uh, and it's very important to things like the rise of modernism. Right. And, you know, the notion of the disciplinary Christian self. So in Calvinism, that's a really big thing, the, the discipline that is there. Uh, Lutheranism doesn't lack that completely, but it doesn't have it to the same degree. And one of the reasons why I personally was attracted to the Lutheran Church was that it was more symbolic and it was more beautiful. Mm. And I actually served as an acolyte, and I had to put on special clothes, and I would also sing in the choir. And that sort of uh, more traditional aspect of the Lutheran Church was something that attracted me, whereas the Calvinist churches were very stark mm. and um, not symbolic. <laughs> At least that element wasn't as prominent as it was in the Lutheran church. I took my confirmation. I used to sit in the back of the church with my father, who was um, 
a professor in veterinary medicine, and he also got a second PhD when he went to Georgia, which was in biochemistry, which was his real love. He loved chemistry, and he especially loved biochemistry. And uh, my father was a person that I loved very much. He had a huge influence on me, as did my mother. My mother was in English literature. And um, so I would sit in the back because I was an acolyte. And when the service would be over, I had to go to the front and go to the altar, enter by the side door, and then put out the candles. So my father would sit with me in the very back. And one beautiful spring day, not long after I was confirmed in the church, meaning I became a church member and I had all the rights and duties of a church member. Um, my father was walking with me. Uh, it was a beautiful day. And he turned to me and asked me if I truly believed in the Trinity. And that was a question that left me speechless. No doubt because I had a very strong relationship with my father and I trusted his intellect and I learned from him. And the very fact that he asked the question indicated to me that he didn't believe in it. Right. Or in any case that it was open to doubt. Right. And I couldn't answer. I couldn't say anything. And after a while he told me a story of a missionary who went to China and tried to convert a sage and to convince the sage that three and one uh, were not a contradiction. So that story um, really affected me and especially because my father told it to me and I had a strong relationship with my pastor. So I went to him probably the same week and told him something to the effect that I have doubts about the Trinity. And uh, he wasn't able to remove those doubts. And in fact, his approach was one that I rebelled from mm -hmm. because he told me that St. Paul had said that if you drink the communion, the Lord's Supper, without belief in the Trinity, you drink damnation into your heart. And that's very frightening, but Paul didn't say that. Paul said, if you drink it without belief. Mm. And of course, he's understanding belief as belief in the Trinity, but the verse doesn't have any reference to that. And then he told me some other things. And so the result of that was that I was actually repelled. Right. And then over the next four years, I began to drift away. And by the time that I was 16, I didn't believe anymore. In fact, I became an atheist, and I didn't remain very comfortable with that for very long, maybe for a year, maybe a little bit longer. And then the process began of trying to find my way back. Mm. And one of the first steps in that was history. I went to the University of Missouri. I had never, uh, my father by this time, by the way, was teaching at the University of Missouri, and my mother was too. And um, So you moved to Columbia. So we had moved to Columbia, Columbia Missouri. Missouri. Right. And um, so the head of the department taught us the introductory world history or world civilization class. And uh, I really fell in love with that professor. He was so good and so insightful, and he made history make sense. But one of the things that he said to me that was a revelation, what, what he said to the whole class was that Jesus Christ would not have been a Trinitarian, mm. which was a pretty wow. rough thing to say in Missouri. Right. But that's what he said, and he said that you know, the Trinity developed over stages in history. Jesus Christ was a Jew who was sent to the Jews. The Jews don't believe in anything like Trinity. So therefore, Jesus Christ would have believed in the oneness of God. Well, that was really medicine to my soul and music to my ears. And that begins a process of finding my way back to God. Um, 
I took a class in early modern philosophy. Again, I had really good professors, and uh, I can never thank the University of Missouri enough for the tremendous good they did to me. Professors who really cared about students. Mm. But this professor was a prof professor who was really good in Greek philosophy, and uh, he would read the books, Descartes, Leibniz, uh, Spinoza, Hume, a lot and mm -hmm. other works and he would read them to us and it's like you can get this you can follow these words it's not magic right. you can actually learn to think like this and because so many of the early modern philosophers emphasized the necessary oneness of God then that also struck me mm -hmm. that God is one and one is God and I had in fact what I regarded to be a spiritual experience in which I resolved that God was one and that he must be one. And then also I studied English literature, which I love very much. I had dual majors in history and in English literature. And I love Shakespeare, but I also love John Milton. Mm. I didn't like modern literature. I, I liked medieval uh, old English, medieval Renaissance. But John Milton, I really loved. And here again, I had one of the best professors I ever had. And he taught us how to read Milton. And he enabled us to envision the movement of the poetry. And I would spend sometimes most of the night reading Milton. And um, I read everything that he wrote. But what really stuck in my mind was how beautiful it must have been to believe like that. And if only I could believe like that, but I felt I can't do that because this is most, mostly mythological. Mm. There's so much mythological content in it. And then also there is the issue of the authenticity of the scripture, which is very important. Right. So that was the state that I was in and I went to Cornell University, I got a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship, um, and I went there in 1969, and um, there I had to take a class in African American literature. Okay. That was one of the requirements, which I was very happy to do. And again, I had grown up in the South, and although we didn't mix with blacks, and we couldn't mix with blacks, that's just the segregated South was that way. Uh, Athens, Georgia must have been 40% black, but you never saw them on the streets. You never mixed with them ever. Uh, but, you know, you'd see them, mm -hmm. and you'd see them farming, and you'd see them doing uh, the, the tasks that they did in society. And so I took the black literature class, and because it wasn't my major, I wanted to get ahead and read those books before the semester started so that I could focus on my own uh, concentration during the semester. And so I began with W.E.B. Du Bois, The Soul of Black, Souls of Black Folks, which really was an illumination to me because this explained the South that I had grown up in. Mm -hmm. uh, I then read a book which was called Kane, C-A-N-E, by Toomer, who was part of the Harlem Renaissance, which is a beautiful book, and it just reminded me of the South. I really loved the South, and I loved the nature of the South. I used to go hiking or camping uh, every month, at least once. And he talked about the pine trees and the wind blowing through the pine trees, mm -hmm. and it was a beautiful, enchanting book. And then I read another book, which might have been Native Son, but it was... I don't remember that book so well, and I probably didn't read that book thoroughly. I probably just read in it. And then I skipped to the autobiography of Malcolm X. Okay. I believe that was January the 1st, 1970, and I read that book all afternoon and all night. I could not put it down, and it just grabbed me. First of all, little personal touches like the fact that Malcolm was from Nebraska, and I was from Nebraska. And the Ku Klux Klan of Nebraska burned down his house in Omaha. So it's like, okay, well, this is pretty dramatic. Mm -hmm. 
Klan, and maybe I didn't even know there was a Ku Klux Klan in Nebraska. I didn't imagine things like that. And then he goes to Michigan, and I have family roots in Michigan as well. So those things all make this personal to me in a way that some people might not understand. Hmm. But um, Malcolm's father was killed, of course, right. in East Lansing. And so the book held me, and, um, you know, uh, it hooked me. That's just, the, I couldn't put it down. I read it all night long, and then by about 7 a.m., the sun had come up, and I had finished the chapter on pilgrimage. And I went to the window, I opened my curtain, I had an apartment that looked out over Lake Cayuga, and um, upstate New York, upstate New York, Ithaca, Ithaca. Cornell. And I sat down in my chair. It's a beautiful day, new snow everywhere. And um, I just asked myself, what did you learn from this book? And I answered, you learned that Allah and God are the same. Uh, If you'd asked me that question on an examination, I would have surely gotten it right. But in my heart, it didn't exist. In my heart, I had been brought up in the Christian church to believe that Muslims worshipped that Muslims worshipped another god, Allah. That was sort of like Baal of the ancient Phoenicians. And so I, I got it that now Allah and God are the same, and that Allah, God, guided Malcolm X. And that's all it took. Basically, I was in Islam from that time on. I came in with uh, amazing conviction, and then I just begin to study, and one thing follows another. So, it, just so I, I don't want to like step too far back, but but just uh, before reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, you're you're obviously I mean this is the late sixties, the nineteen sixties, early seventies, surely the civil rights movement. It, and that's at the backdrop of all of this. How are you responding to that, if anything? Uh, so the 1960s for people like me was, first of all, uh, the era of the anti-war movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what counted to me first. Right. And then the civil rights movement um, begins to be strong. In that. And so, in my case, um, my opposition to the war in Vietnam, which had a lot to do with the things I was taught at the University of Missouri and the insights I had to what was really going on there and the nature of the military industrial complex, which President Eisenhower had warned us against. Mm-hmm. So, I was one of those millions of young people who was very concerned with stopping the war and not supporting the war. And um, that led, unfortunately, to a rupture between me and my family. My family were very conservative and they were Republican and they were right wing. And so therefore my position Um, was one that I'm very sorry to say alienated me from my grandfather and, you know, from my uh, father and my mother. And that was painful for them and painful for me. And it's painful, painful for me even to think back on it. But I became a leftist. Um, Maybe one of the reasons is because my family was very right wing. And so I sort of bounced the other way, and I became a very left-wing and a very concerned with stopping the military-industrial complex, which may sound like an absurd uh, desire, but that's what we talked about. That's what we, um, me and my friends, we were concerned with. Um, to be very frank, although I had tremendous respect for Dr. King, and I was riveted by his speeches. Um, it was the Black Power Movement that really got me. Mm-hmm. And when uh, H. Rap Brown began to talk about Black Power, then I felt that 
I understand what that means and that this is the way to do it. If you want your rights, you've got to be able to stand up for them and you've got to be able to take them. Um, I had friends that were also uh, connected you know, to the Black Power movement and um, I, I really felt that Black Power was so therapeutic. I don't know if the listener uh, would understand that or sympathize with that. Some, of course, will, some won't. But uh, the thing is, is that I really felt that emphasis on the beauty of black people mm. and the integrity of black people and the assertion you know, of their humanity in this way was really good. I was so, that's what made me happy. And of course, in the 1960s, that also becomes one of the dominant themes that black is beautiful. And I agree that black is beautiful. And um, there was also Muhammad Ali. Uh, there was uh, James Brown. And a lot of things that were going on that were really changing the way that people looked at things. I did have respect for Malcolm X, but it was essentially as a socialist. Ooh. And it wasn't until I went to Cornell that I discovered that he had this religious dimension of Islam, which was not clear to me before that, although I knew that he had been in the nation of Islam. And, um, and you knew of the nation of Islam? Uh, not very much, not, not really. Very much. Not very much. I remember when it was broadcast across the United States and, uh, you know, the hate that hate bred. Was that the name of that program? Yeah. And things like that. But... Again, I found the Nation of Islam very interesting. Right. And interestingly enough, uh, my last year at the University of Missouri, I took a class in the history of the Old South. Okay. Again, with a really good teacher. And my paper that I wrote for that class was on the African roots of the slaves. Okay. And I did a pretty good job with that. And I wrote about the kingdom of Mali, Songhai. Right. And I wrote about um, uh, Islam and how rational it was. And, uh, you know, but again, it, it, it didn't attract me as a personal choice. In fact, in those days, I used to read a magazine in French, which was called Jeune Afrique, Young Africa which was a French socialist journal. And I liked it a lot. And it had in it articles about Islam also, because one of the objectives of Jeune Afrique was to convince its readers, especially African readers, that there was complete compatibility between Islam and socialism. Mm. And so... Um, I often would read, article, would read articles and just be amazed about how rational, how reasonable Islam was. I remember reading the Shahada, La ilaha illallah, and just wondering, how do you pronounce that? It must be beautiful. It's alliterated. Yeah, you're right. But uh, in any case, it was Malcolm that brought me into the faith. And no doubt the strength of his incredible personality, as reflected in his book and his life work. So, do you formally embrace the faith when you say it brought you to Islam? No, you. Uh, well, when I say that it brought me to yeah. Islam, it means that I had no doubts about it, and the um, truth of the. Yeah. But I didn't know that you have to embrace the faith, and I didn't know any Muslims. That's right. And in fact, I had a Syrian friend whose name was Adnan from Damascus, whom I had met before I became a Muslim, and he knew I liked languages. Okay. And so he had promised me that if you ever want to learn Arabic, I would love to teach you. And so at the same time that I'm entering Islam, I also asked Adnan to come to my house once a week and to teach me Arabic. I began with Arabic, but I never told him I was a Muslim. And I didn't know that I could, and I didn't know that I would be accepted if I did. And But I, I was reading the Quran, I was believing in it. I memorized Al-Fatiha in English. And I remember I would stand on those beautiful hills at Cornell and recite it facing towards the West, which is not the Qibla, but, you know, just having these yeah. incredible spiritual experiences as I recited Al-Fatiha in English. And Ayatul Kursi was just 
to me, beyond words. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, and this is something that Cat Stevens, Yusuf Islam, has talked about, that, you know, we do get something out of the English translation. Yeah. You know, like, do you understand that? Right. That it's not just um, sort of some kind of marginal thing, that you can actually get some guidance out of that. Right. So, um, you know, mashallah, tabarakallah, I didn't really know what it meant to become a Muslim, but, you know, I did believe. And I remember that I had a Tunisian in one of my seminars at Cornell, and I thought he was French because he's always speaking French mm -hmm. and he's always got le monde. And, and so one night my first wife and I went out to go skiing. We'd go skiing maybe once a week. And uh, he was there at the ski lodge. And I asked him his name, and I expected to be Jacques or Pierre or something like that. And he said, Mahmoud. And I'd never heard the name Mahmoud. So I said, Muhammad. And he said, no, Mahmoud. And three times I said, Muhammad. And he said, no, Mahmoud. And then <laughs> I got it. Right. But then as I took, uh, you know, the ski lift up to the top of the mountain, I told myself that you love the name Muhammad, don't you? Uh -huh. Because the fact that you thought his name was Muhammad changed everything about him in your eyes. Wow. But then um, my draft board was breathing down my neck. They didn't like me very much. <laughs> and um, they were going to order me for induction. Right. And therefore, I decided that I would make an Islamic conscientious objection to the war. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, I needed to have knowledge about Islam. Mm -hmm. So, Brother Adnan, this would have been in April, about four months later, um, he came to teach me the Arabic lesson, and I said, like, I have to tell you something very personal. And this is in my room, right? In my living room, but so let's go over to the corner. I don't know who's going to hear it, you know, right. but I took him over the corner. And I just told him, I've become a Muslim. Of course, he was beyond himself in joy. I didn't really know because like the black Muslims, they didn't seem to welcome white people. And right. like, I don't know how other Muslims feel about that. But, uh, and I told him, I have to tell you that because I need to make an Islamic statement of conscientious objection to the war in Vietnam and to induction. Mm -hmm. So he said, I've got just the man for you right tonight. And this is Sharif Amur Hassan, who was teaching, he was an Egyptian teaching law at, uh, he, was, he was from Columbia University and teaching at Cornell. And so we went to his house and he was actually working on that very topic. And he gave me books and he said, you read these books and read these passages and then you write your objection. Maybe I can defend you in court mm. if it comes to that. In the end, uh, someone else defended me, but... Um, you know, and then of course the word got out to the Muslim students at Cornell that I was a Muslim. They were about 100 okay. and they're all from all over the world. And we had about four or five for Jomar. But, um, this Kuwaiti, Abdul Aziz al Fulaj, may Allah bless him, he brought me all the Islamic books they had, which was a stack, you know, about maybe three feet tall. Yeah. And, um, most of them you could speed read. And uh, I had read all their books in probably two weeks, and I became the imam, basically. Uh, I've become now the most knowledgeable, and they've got me giving khutbahs and doing other things. But, um, you know, so it was really this uh, need to respond to the draft right. that brought me into the public sphere. And then people like Adnan, uh, God bless him, he told me, you know, everything in the Qur'an you read, you've got to do. Mm -hmm. So you can't eat pork, you can't drink wine, and you do have to make salat. Well, that might sound like something that doesn't need to be said. A, a duh moment, as they say today. <laughs> uh, for Christians, uh, it wasn't, because we tend to look at the biblical tradition as something that pertained to them, right. but not necessarily to us. This was part of our Christian mentality. 
And so therefore, it's like these commands are for another people in another time. But then when he said that, no, you've got to actually do all of this, then it made sense. And so then we got rid of the wine and we stopped buying pork and I learned how to make salat. I got a little handbook and, and uh, then, I be, then I really come into the deen as, you know, you would, in a way that's recognizable, you know, right. to other Muslims. Right, right. 